Hello coders, this is Darren and today Jared and I are going to introduce the Unity 3D development environment to you. I'm very excited to begin the Unity 3D videos since it is my area of expertise and hopefully before long we will get into working on some really cool projects together. After this tutorial you should have a clear understanding of how to begin developing your games and you will have a solid foundation to maximize your workflow when developing. We will cover the scene and game view, the inspector, the debug console, the hierarchy, the project panel, and the profiler. Let's start off with the scene view. The scene view is where you will be able to navigate about your game in a free camera mode style. You can pan across the scene, rotate around objects, and zoom in to inspect elements in your game in detail. Now, navigating around the scene is best done with a mouse with a scroll wheel. Note that these controls correspond to Windows users, although controls on Apple keyboards are similar. To rotate the scene, press Alt with left click and drag your mouse. To pan the scene, press the scroll wheel and drag your mouse. To zoom, simply scroll the wheel on your mouse. Now that we have a good handle on navigating our scenes, we need to know how to manipulate objects within our scene. Let's bring our attention to these five buttons in the top left corner of the screen. These buttons are your best tools for altering the orientation of objects in our scenes. These buttons translate directly to your Q, W, E, R, and T keys on your keyboard. Q is our pan tool, so we can ignore that button for now. Mainly, we will use W for moving objects, E for rotating objects, and R for scaling objects. T is commonly used in 2D mode, so for now we can ignore that as well, but I will discuss how to enter 2D mode momentarily. Now, if we hit W, we can move this object on whichever axis we want by clicking the axis and dragging our mouse. We can also click on the origin and drag our mouse on multiple axes at once. If we press E, we can click the axis we want to rotate on and drag our mouse. Alternatively, we could click somewhere in the sphere and rotate on multiple axes at once. Now let's try pressing R to scale our object. The concept remains the same. We can scale on any singular axis, or we can grab at the origin and scale on every axis at once. If you make any of these adjustments to your object but do not like the result, you can simply press Ctrl and Z to reverse your changes. Now let's focus our attention to the buttons on this toolbar here. Each one of these will have something to do with how objects and other gizmos are seen within your scene view. They have nothing to do with what will be seen when your game runs. With this drop down, you can define the way you want your scene to be shaded. This 2D button will face your camera towards 2D objects in your scene and it will render your 3D objects as if your camera was orthographic. In 2D mode, you can press T to move your 2D objects and rotate your 2D objects around conveniently. The button that looks like a sun simply controls whether your lights are active or inactive. The button next to that controls if sound is inactive or active. The gizmos dropdown gives you control over the various 2D gizmos in your scene view by determining their size or if they should even show up. Finally, there is a search bar here that will give you clear visual representation of where objects are hiding in your scene. Next up is our game view. Now, a lot of what is going on in the scene view is not going to be seen in our game view. For instance, the light gizmos and the object outlines. Our game view is going to only represent what a player would see. Nothing will happen, however, until we hit our play button. In this video, we will not discuss how we got the blocks to change colors like this, as it involves knowledge of scripting and that is beyond the scope of this tutorial. However, you now see the relationship between the scene and the game view. There are some other buttons to address on the game view. This drop down controls our aspect ratio of our project. The maximize on play button does what its name suggests. 
If it is selected, the game will go full screen when you play it. Mute audio is another obvious button, and the gizmos dropdown operates the same way as the scene views gizmos dropdown. The stats button can be pressed to reveal some useful information such as triangle count and the current frames per second our game is running at. Look into all of the stats in this window when doing performance tests on your game. With all of that, the game view is pretty much summed up. Let's talk about Unity's inspector window next. This window will hold component information for each object in our game while also allowing us to modify variables of components, even at runtime. Components are just modifications or behaviors placed on objects to direct them to behave in a particular way. Everything from rendering the object to the screen, to applying gravity to the object, can be placed on the object in the form of a component. If we click any object in the scene, we will see that each one at least has a transform component. This transform component has position, rotation, and scale information and we may modify these values here as an alternate to modifying them directly from the scene view. If we click on one of our cubes, we will see how they are changing color. I wrote a script that would change the colors of the material on the cubes and attach the script to the object. At this point, the script became a component of the cube object. From my script, I give the user of the inspector the ability to change variables such as how fast the colors change and which colors to change to. These variables can be changed while the game is running, giving us an opportunity to see how these changes affect things with instant feedback. When it comes to debugging our games, the debug console can be an excellent tool. If we want to make sure something is working, we can display it in text to the console. For this project, I have all the cube's initial colors printing out when the game first starts. As we are not covering scripting in this video, you can look forward to in-depth scripting tutorials in the future to learn how to do things like this. For now, I just want to show you how the debugger can potentially be used to extract useful information about how your game is running. I've covered a good bit of Unity's IDE to get you guys started, but there are still some very important parts left to go over. So I'm going to go ahead and hand you all off to Jared. Thanks, Darren, and hello, coders. This is Jared, and today I'm going to cover the Hierarchy panel, the Project panel, and the Profiler panel. The hierarchy panel is located in the top left of the screen if you are using the default panel configuration. This panel contains a list of every game object that you have in your scene. You can add objects into your scene by clicking on the create button in the hierarchy. Another method of adding a game object through the hierarchy is by right clicking on an object and selecting the type of object that you would like to create. For now, I'm just going to add a cube. Note that this method creates a child object under the object that you clicked. It is important to note that when you create a child of an object, the child's position and rotation are now going to be based on the parent object. For instance, now that I have a child cube, when I move the parent around in the scene, the child moves as well. This is also true for rotations applied to the parent. The child can be manipulated without affecting the parent's values though. You can also search for objects in the hierarchy by using the search bar. A neat trick to use is to search for an object based on type. To do this, all you have to do is type T followed by a colon. And then if we type in light, we can see our light highlighted in the scene. You can do this by clicking on the drop down next to the search icon and clicking on type as well. Now that we have covered the basics of the hierarchy panel, we are going to move on to the project panel. 
if you are using the default panel layout, the project panel will be on the bottom of the screen. The project panel contains a list of all of the assets that you are using in your project from scripts to texture files. The assets directory is always going to be your base directory. However, you can add directories to your assets directory in order to get some organization. It is important to note that Unity has some directory names reserved as special directories. One example of this is the standard assets directory. When I import a package into Unity, the assets will usually move into the standard assets directory, like so. To add a folder to the assets directory, you can either right click on the assets directory or click on the create button in the project panel. Another important note regarding the project panel is that the arrangement of directories will be reflected in your file viewing application. I am using a Mac, so if I open up Finder, the arrangement of directories will be exactly the same as the project panel, with the exception of meta files, which we will cover, cover later. You can create scripts by right clicking and then clicking on the type of script that you would like to create. You can also add files to the assets directory by dragging from your documents directory as an example. Notice that when we add a model, we can also see the model's mesh, the model's animations, and the avatar by clicking on the toggle button attached to the model. To edit the view of the assets folder, you can use the slider at the bottom right of the panel. At the lowest setting, the assets folder will show a list of the directories and files. At the highest setting, you will see some fairly large icons instead. Finally, another cool thing that you can do to help with adding items to objects in-game is locking the inspector. If you've noticed, when I click on an item in the projects panel, the inspector gives a description of that item. But, if you are editing a game object, it can sometimes be easier to lock the inspector on the game object by clicking on the lock icon at the top right of the screen. This will keep the inspector on the object and allow you to easily drag over scripts to objects. Okay, that covers a basic overview of the project panel. For our final topic, we are going to cover the profiler panel. This panel is not included in the base layout, but it is really easy to add this panel to the layout. Simply click on the window button in the top menu, then click on the profiler tab. And now you can drag and drop the profiler panel wherever you want. The Profiler panel records information on the CPU usage, the GPU usage, rendering, memory usage, audio, and physics. This tool is essential in the final days of game development when you are really trying to get the most out of your game, or if you are experiencing a slow frame rate, for example. Now let's run a basic example to see how the Profiler operates with a relatively simple demonstration. As you can see, the profiler is capturing data for every frame that is rendered. In the graph, we can see several colored line graphs. The colors of these graphs are defined in the left-hand column of the profiler. You can also scroll through the profiler frame by frame to see where any issues are occurring. We aren't going to go into a ton of detail on the profiler now, but just for fun's sake, let's stress test this program and see what happens. As a test, I'm going to create a lot of objects very quickly and have physics act on each of those objects.
let's see how well it goes. Wow, as you can see, even with all of these objects being created, the program really isn't slowing below 60 FPS, which is what we want to be around. If you want to toggle off some of the items being listed in the profiler, all we have to do is click on the color box next to the item. This will help you sort through the data a little more easily. Okay, I think that pretty much does it for the profiler at this point, but we will cover this in greater detail in later tutorials. That's all we have for this tutorial, so be sure to subscribe and check back later for some of our upcoming Unity and c -sharp tutorials, including an introduction to the basics of C-sharp, if statements in C-sharp, and our Unity script series is coming up soon. Thanks for watching, and this has been a Renaissance Coders tutorial.